because that should be always at the forefront, livelihood, our bodies, how we relate to each other, how we relate to our environments and our different habitats, uh, the, sur the sources of Mother Earth, how we take care of them. And so my question is, how, do you, how would you define peace building in your very specific water-related work, practice, research, and what are the main conflicts and challenges that you, your community, and your collaborators find? And I'm thinking in terms of, uh, for instance, the limits to stewardship of water or um, the limits around sovereignty of water or decision-making. And uh, whoever wants to, to start first can, mm -hmm. can go. And if you don't want to answer, that's also an option, of course. <laughs> Do you like the phone? Yeah. Or you can get the more professional okay. mic. Yeah, I'll use this one for practice. Okay. okay, hopefully no one's making fun of me that my feet are barely touching the ground. <laughs> I keep trying to scoot up, but um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a small Pueblo woman. Um, so what does peace mean to me? I, I think peace for me starts, um, uh, what we're taught is uh, through prayer. Um, I think that we need to first be at peace with ourselves inside um, before we can work with others um, to have peace. Um, I think some of the, <clears throat> you know, we have been praying um, on this stretch of the river since um 1680 when we uh came down here um since the pueblo revolt in new mexico now now called new mexico and um um you know when we first came here we um prayed to the river and asked for permission to be here um and for the river to help us and help us to survive after um years and years of uh, devastation moving from our original Pueblo, which is from um, the Salinas Pueblo area in Cuaray, moving with our sister Pueblo, um, and then being brought down here by the Spanish in 1680. Um, we asked the river for permission to be here and to make, um, to have, uh, for us to settle here. And so um, I think the real um, impediments for us is really um, access, right? Um, even when I was studying um, my and doing my research um, 2015, 2016, I had to go through the tribal police department that work with the border patrol for them to even open the gate for me, for me to, um, you know, take pictures of plants and take some samples and um, just, you know, uh, mark and GPS um, some of the the area that was in question and, and based not to um, show that area publicly, but for that to be a center point for uh, the land use land cover uh, maps that I produced. And um, yeah, just access. Um, uh, access to the river has uh, become even more limited um, with the border crisis that is happening now. Our men used to go to the, uh, still go to the river um, at least twice a year to open and close our ceremonies. And um, those times are being um, limited to, they could stay out there for hours before. And now it's like, you have an hour, hour and a half to get in and get out, right? And um, just seeing you know, or knowing about the barbed wire and all of those things um, that are happening and just the violence really along the river. Um, for me as a Pueblo woman, I have to travel a little bit further up north to have access and to set my feet and my hands into the river. Um, last Sunday, uh, me, my mother, and um, it was basically my Dene Navajo uncle, Alex Mares, went to um, the river to welcome the water down as it came down um, for what El Paso Water Utilities and others call 
the river season, um, which I absolutely hate. Um, and uh, I was even, you know, making comments or semi trolling on, on LinkedIn of all places. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah access i have to we have to go up and and um us setting our feet in and and praying um there and making offerings and asking the river to be good to us and to help us and to protect us and i i um was able to throw uh, uh put my drone up into the air and really see and we believe in in um you know, many spiritual beings and people that work at Waco Tanks. I know Dr. Walsh, you do work at, at Waco Tanks and know that um, we're protected and um, the original instructions from our ancestors are painted on those walls. And so um, when I threw the drone up in the air, um, put the drone up in the air and throw it. But um, I was able to see and looking at the videos after with just like we believe in the water serpent, right? And that the water serpent comes down and helps us and lives in the water and comes from the goes into the clouds and down to our water systems. And it was really beautiful to watch the way that the water came uh, down and um, like a serpent and how it meanders just like the river used to. So yeah, for us, it's, it's access and, um, I'm at least grateful that we're able to go a little bit up north and be able to access the river from there. Well, I guess I'll say something since the mic just got handed to me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I think, uh, what is the question about peace building? Well, you know, I, I think this book I'm writing about the Chihuahuan Desert. One of the one of the premises that I've adopted is to take the actual timeline that the desert itself offers as the timeline for the book, and that's a kind of a tricky question because as we can debate whether how old the desert is, etc. But um, let's say somewhere between like eight thousand and twelve thousand years, and then then we also know from you know traditional. Uh, traditional memory and traditional stories from like the footprints of white sands that like there's been human occupation here for at least 20,000 years or time immemorial, however you want to put it, but like since, since older than desert, right. And, and yet we like grasp and grapple in this, I think I I've come to see as like a more and more kind of absurd and facile way in our academic conversations with the the kind of false promise of sustainability. Oh, how are we gonna find sustainable solutions? Which itself I think is like a, a butchering of like genuine 60s environmental rad radicalism, just kind of like wa watered down. And the reason I find this so frustrating is like, we already have an answer for what sustainable living in this region looks like. We have thousands upon thousands of years and hundreds and hundreds of generations of examples of like how you can survive and thrive in this desert. And the two components of that, unfortunately, are extremely low density populations because there's just not that much, you know, we're like big mammals um, and it's hard for us to live in this environment and relatively high mobility, you just be able to move around. And so we're, we're beyond like what you would call carrying capacity. We're beyond, we're like outside of the, the threshold of like the, the natural limits. And so I think that this is, this is, this gets very, very tricky because the implication of that is a, um, a, a really terrifyingly fundamental restructuring of every single aspect of our of our lives and civilization and urban planning and and just like and just the population here. Um, I say this, you know, kind of as a dodging the you know the question, but also just kind of raising a, a set of premises that might kind of reframe that question, like. Um, 
of you know tr trying to get us out of the 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 dynamic that i see that is so prevalent where there's like some kind of not great policy and then we kind of like i talk about this in the first book compensatory building like something gets built they don't really know what the side effects are going to be side effects ensue I don't know, let's build something else and let's compensate for that by like building something else by like but continuing to like mitigate you know the the circumstances um and and in that process the question of what peace is the question of what sustainability is like just gets more and more watered down such that we're really responding to these like very surface level symptoms um instead of like a, a much deeper level you know kind of um kind of uh uh, kind of dynamics and so I, I think about I think about the meaning of the, the term freedom as a synonym for for wild or self-willed um, and you can think about it I think in terms of access you can think about it in terms of like river restoration you can think about it in a variety of different registers but I'm, I'm very interested in thinking about peace in the in that context in, in the context like what what would what would the most kind of self-willed freedom look like not just for you know ancestral peoples and then whoever the settler you know descendants are which is most mexicans of which we also have to contend with but that's a whole other you know can, can of worms um i can do no, i can do this yeah good good yeah 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 oh yeah yeah i'm better thanks <laughs> um oh it's great to get to think like this. Thank you for the question. So one thing I'll offer is, so for almost 25 years now, I've been um, working a lot in city departments. So going into um, rooms of uh, frontline personnel, sanitation workers, like I said, line workers, uh, maintenance staff. Right now I'm working with a construction and concrete crew and a vegetation management um, crew in Austin, and then also working with other, go other government per personnel. And I just like to say, um, government is not inherently innovative. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> right? it's, it's, it's a very limited system <laughs> in terms of, of what we've got. And when I think about how, um, at least in Austin, the city is set up, it's basically set up to be risk averse. Right. So not to take on new innovative ideas, not to get sued, <laughs> not to have a flood, even though we built in floodplains all across central Texas, you know. Um, and what I get to do and what we get to do when we make art is we get to try new ideas. And we get to spark imagination and we get to have fun and we get to go towards the joy. And I would think one the biggest one of the biggest things I think that has helped in our peacemaking efforts <laughs> is to ask people what they love about their job, about their community, about water, <laughs> about their pool. And um, so I'll just tell you a quick story. Uh, we um, were working again with aquatics uh, on a three year plan to. Uh, make dances in three different East Austin neighborhood pools and and to help, again, um, build relationships for these communities um, with city leadership, with themselves, with other, with across Austin, with other advocates for aquatics. And the last pool we got to work with was in Givens Pool, which was the second bill, the second pool built for the Black community during desegregation in Austin in 1959. It was a beautiful pool. It was uh, the jewel of the neighborhood. They had the Miss East Austin beauty pageants at the pool where the women would come down the catwalk in their bathing suits. <laughs> you know, it was the community gathering place for the black community um, and uh, had so much history, so much pride. and. Now here we are 2019, um, of course, we're in one of the fastest gentrifying neighborhoods in all of the United States in East Austin. Uh, many black, longtime black community residents have either chosen to leave or been forced to leave property taxes and all those kinds of things I'm sure you all understand. But this pool and this park was still the gathering place. 
And the city had long, uh, of course, as you might imagine, uh, not had a great relationship with the neighborhood. <laughs> the neighborhood had not had a great relationship with the city, uh, particularly once actually desegregation happened and kids were forced across the school, across the city and the black high school changed. Uh, black, black high school closed down because white families wouldn't send their white children there. So it wouldn't wasn't officially desegregated. And so a judge, you know, ordered it closed. All of these kinds of things meant that um, there had been so much loss in the neighborhood. And at the same time, this pool was leaking hundreds of thousands of gallons of water a day. Because it was built in 1959, had never had a major upgrade. There were cracks all in the foundation. And the last thing this neighborhood wanted to hear was that their pool was going to close. Because it was one more example of the city's, you know, racist policies that constantly leave this neighborhood behind. But this pool was an extreme environmental hazard. So what do you do? Uh, and so we had a cast of almost 50 community members, uh, young people to elders in the show, along with the maintenance staff who took the neighbors into the pump room so they could see all the water <laughs> spilling, <laughs> like why this why this pool had reached the end of its life. Um, and all of a sudden, the, the curtains were drawn back as to why it you know, because uh, again, I'll say that in, in uh, my time of working in government and in communities, most people I meet are good people. And most people working in public service and in government are doing it because they care and they want to make a difference. They're inside this system that doesn't actually allow us to value, you know, there's all these challenges of actually valuing human beings and all of that, as we well know. So um, the neighborhood finally felt like they, well, not only did they get to see the problem, they got to hear from the maintenance staff, not the council member on the dais saying, yeah, your pool's gonna, your pool, pool's cut, but from the maintenance guy, why he could no longer fix it. And so in the show that we put to, on with the neighbors and the aquatics maintenance staff and lifeguards, two of the maintenance men did a scuba diving duet where they showed how they repair pools and they do that by uh, scuba diving and gluing and, you know, oh, me in the water today, I tell you, that's just my choreographer, you know, I have no sense of space. But, um, and you could, it was like there was a sigh of relief or not relief, but 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 almost like an exhale when the audience could hear the maintenance staff really explain, we've done all we can, the pool's at the end of its life. We love this pool and it's, it's done. And fortunately that bond passed and there was money to build a new pool. And so that cast became a committee that had direct influence on the design of the new pool through our Austin's African-American Quality of Life Initiative, uh, commission, I'm sorry, to really direct the design of the new pool. So the community um, felt like their voice mattered and actually had a systematic way to uh, influence what was coming next. And so that built some peace. That built some peace. So um, I just, yeah, what do you love? Yeah, what brings you joy? Um, I love that. We started with uh, negative stuff. Uh, sometimes uh, research around water starts from a place of, of suffering, dispossession, uh, expulsion from the necropolitics of water. And, uh, and then you started to talk about the challenges that you find in your job and that started like introduced to the conversation around the methods, the methods that we can uh, apply collectively. And uh, I want to invite you to um, dig more into the, the methodologies that you apply to your work and that you can offer the community. And by community here, I mean at, in the largest way we can consider it. So like civilian communities, communities of governmental workers, uh, officials, uh, commissioners, and so on and so on. Uh, because the the question is, how can the, the work that you do, I, I'm asking a student's question. I love the student's question. They're always about how can we actually activate change? Yeah. And those are the important questions. And sometimes as 
I'm speaking as, as an academic right now. Uh, yeah, we are very good at dodging uh, <laughs> the answer, as CJ also mentioned before. But step by step, um, what are the actionable tools, the practical tools that we, or, or habits, or new behaviors, or gestures that we can offer the communities? First and Short. To what I answered. Yes, I've got this. I had to write it in that book that took seven years to do that you'll hear more about tomorrow. <laughs> um, so those are the three questions we lead with everywhere we go are what do you love about? What's hard? What's hard about the job? Or what's hard, you know, what's what's a challenge here for you? And what do you want people to know? And that's a great one. What do you want people to know about your job, your community? Um, um, the other, the other thing I'll say is just as a methodology, um, <laughs> wise man once said, you can't tell anybody to do anything, but you can listen them into doing it. And, um, my trick to get, um, grumpy linemen to do a dance for 6,000 people was to spend a lot of time listening and to build a trusting relationship where they were willing to be vulnerable and take a risk. And we all know how to do that. But what I've found everywhere I've gone is most people don't have anybody interested in what their daily life is like. And so just asking the question opens the door and then we build trust and then we build collaboration and then we can do something hard together. So that's my advice. I just, I have an answer to this question, but I just, I really just want to iter reiterate this whole go toward the joy thing. I mean, I have so many students that come to me wanting to, you know, write about the border. They're like, I hate the razor wire. I hate the fence. I hate all this stuff, you know, about the border. I'm like, look, man, you can't, you cannot, you, you, you cannot sustain, especially a dissertation, like fueled on things you hate, right? You, you have got to, you, you've got to, like, I wrote a book about the border because I love the border and I, I love the place that has become the border. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I really try to emphasize that also with my students, um, as well, undergrad and grad student alike. Um, as for methodology, I, I would say two things, you know, I, I think chronology is really important. I think as generally speaking, we're like a time illiterate society, no real, we've inherited these categories of time. Like we're in the 21st century, like since the incarnation of Jesus Christ in like a different part of the world, you know, it's like, that's not desert time, you know, that's like something else. Um, oh, well, that's a 19th century thing. I've broken the, I break the entire history of the desert down to basically two kind of two periods. The, the period up to concrete, like modern concrete supported irrigation and like hydraulic management and then everything after. And so I think that for me, like building various forms of time literacy with students or communities or whatever, to help them recognize how, how, how rapidly things have changed and how dramatically things have changed in the context of like modern construction materials. And so I think that, um, and I think this is a real teaching problem with like young folks today, especially from the border, because you've all grown up during this in incredibly intensive period of border um, of, of border building and border rebuilding, border destruction and river destruction, et cetera. Um, and so even by like my standards, like I, mean, I know there's other people who remember like, you know, definitely remember before the fans, remember like the, the 80s or, you know, before the border, like look totally different, like even in our own memory. Um, and so building that kind of like that, that landscape memory, um, and then I would say one more thing, and this is not going to be a popular, maybe maybe this is, maybe you're not going to like what I'm about to say, uh, but I, I think it has to do with the vocabulary we use. And I um, make it a, a, a very kind of distinct and personal point in the way I speak and the way I write to abolish words like resources from my vocabulary. Because when you start when you call something a resource, you're making an implicit argument about the supremacy of our species. Um, and 
the the relegation of other parts of the more than human world and other members of the more than human world as somehow fitting into our paradigm. Um, the same can be said for game, livestock, you know, just all these kind of euphemisms that de-emphasize the interiority of the more than human world, the sort of the, the potential for, 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 for freedom and self-will in the more than human world. So it's like a small, it's not, it's a small intervention, but I, I think that, that being very careful and mindful about what arguments are embedded in the timescales that we use, what arguments are embedded in the words that we use to talk about the more than human world is to me like, feels like a satisfying practice and a satisfying step in, um, in just kind of building a, a broader different kind of awareness. Now I wanted to go back on something that you said when you were talking about peace and you said about freedom. And I I thought about it like that, you know, we all want freedom for things, but really what we need is liberation, right? And um, like how, thinking about the Rio Grande and like, how can we liberate her? You know, so I just wanted to say that. Um, Oh, okay. Um, yeah, resources. I, I struggle with that word a lot. And with my re research, I focused and uh, bridged the Western and like traditional ecological knowledge through ecosystem services. Right. And so it's good to think about those kind of things through um, like acts of service, right? How does the river provide that service to us? And how can we provide services to her as well? As far as um, <clears throat> methodologies and what um, I could provide for the community, I think for me, foundationally, it always goes back to my cultural core values, right? Um, love, faith, spirituality. Um, caring for each other really you know how do we um embody those things every day um for each other for the land for the plants for the animals for our waterways um how do we really embody those uh things um and the last thing i'll say is first uh, uh, we need to really re-educate ourselves and our mindsets. You talked about this during your keynote. And um, it really is about the way that we think about things and how, and I don't care for, and not that I don't care for them specifically, but I don't care for the language of, um, I lost my train of thought. <sighs> how do we, um, lost it yeah re-education thank you how for us not to be boxed in by other people's mindsets right like when we were talking about really how do we imagine the new world that we're trying to build which is really old views and old traditions right um it bothers me when people say things like well you know getting your land back isn't a possibility why? <laughs> Why is that? Okay? That's your thought process. That isn't my thought process. And I'll never be boxed in by that. And I hope other people are never boxed in through those types of mindsets um, that we move away from, from that colonial mindset of no, we can only, um, as far as water, and I think it's kind of alluded to about the commodification of water, right? And so just radically imagining what our world can really be like um, and uh, not to get too woo, woo or anything, but, you know, just yeah. manifesting that into reality. Um, I think uh, the power of our thoughts is, is um, really strong and we have to really retrain ourselves and re-educate ourselves and 
I'm constantly getting on my children's nerves because I tie everything back to capitalism and colonization. And <laughs> one day they'll appreciate it more, you know? But yeah, really radically imagine what we want the world to be like. Wonder if you have questions for each other. Uh, and, and then also we welcome questions from the audience. I'm not throwing it because I don't want it to fall on the belly. <laughs> um, thank you all of you for your insights. I've learned a lot and I really appreciate it. Um, I was wondering, because you've all mentioned um, a little bit about, um, or a lot bit, um, about this, this paradigm shift of how we relate to water, how we talk about water, our understanding of water. Um, um, and I, maybe that's for most of you, I know that for Andy, that's the paradigm that she was um, born and raised in, this idea that water is ancient, that is alive, that carries memory. Um, and in my own work, as uh, someone who um, ha has a lot of indigenous informed ways of being, but is not from an indigenous community, um, it has been a lot of, uh, how do I shift my relationship to water in, the work that I'm doing. And I'm curious, um, you know, like Annie and I have had lots of conversation about the personhood of water and 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 um and relationship and something that CJ mentioned of um using the the term more than human nature just reminds me a lot of Robin Wall Kimmer's work, which really really informs my work as well. But it, um is how do we um I'm curious as researchers, as um creative people, as people that engage with water how do you see your own responsibility of how you shift your own relationship to water and how how has that manifested in the work that you do because i really believe that that has to be it has to be like a like a felt sense it has to be this connection i feel like that's in the work that i do i, I could see that as the first step um for people to actually make a shift in how um, they exist with water. I really like that, um, Chris, for offering that, um, how they exist with water. So I'm just, I'm just curious if that's something that you think about, that you've thought about is like, how do you um, relate to water? How has your, re your relationship to water shifted throughout your research and your work with water? Thank you. Uh, oh, I love that question uh, so much. So uh, four years ago, I had a a visiting fellowship. I lived for a year in Santa Fe at the school for advanced research. And, um, and I was, you know, I wrote mainly there, uh, finishing the border book or starting the, the, uh, the desert book rather. And then in my, my non-writing time, I just went to as many of the tributaries of the Rio Grande as I could, like up in the high mountains, different, the different rivers up there, just get a sense of the headwaters, much more complex than it is down here. Um, and I think it prompted me to think to myself, because you hear all this, like you hear all this talk about like, oh, this river has been killed, like the Gila's dead, like the Rio Grande is dead. It's like, what would that mean exactly? Like, what what is a river? There's like so, something so ephemeral about it. And I guess I also recognized in the in the documents, you know, the the dam builders are always worried about like sediment building. Uh oh, there's sediment building up behind the dam. What are we gonna do? You know, there's like all this, you know, all this this particulates building up behind the, you know, the, the concrete. And I, I think that my thinking has evolved to the point where I, I've started to think beyond like the water itself. And I've come to think of rivers as systems, as mountain removers. I mean, if we think really broadly, like really big context, really deep time. Land is constantly being kind of stripped away by wind and water, and then it's being replaced through volcanism. And so there's something, um, water is like this conveyance, right? And like we respond to it as biological organisms, but I'm really interested in the, in the relationship between like the biotic and the abiotic and the, the extent to which life on the planet kind of depends upon parts of the planet that are not perceived to be alive or have ever been alive, notwithstanding like 
biochemical rocks, which is like, what's that? It's like mineral, but not really, like it was once alive. Um, and so I think that's how my relationship to, to water has evolved to think about it in a, I guess like a geosystems, you know, sense. And, and in the case of the Rio Grande in particular, and this is not the case for all rivers, certainly not in Texas, um, but I've come to think about the water in terms of the mountains that it's carrying with it. Um, that is again, I think superficially referred to as like sediment or, you know, just, oh, this thing we have to solve, you know, behind behind the dams, but that's just like particulates of, um, of the high country. a good question um oh so i have been thinking just in my as a human on the planet what does it look like to re-nature myself uh, my second child was born in water <laughs> uh, he is a pisces <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I, I would say uh, it is uh, unlearning my, you know, recent ancestors, habits, patterns, dysfunction, <laughs> slowing down, stopping rushing, asking everybody else to rush around me. It drives my children crazy. There's nothing like having children to reorient yourself in the world. But um, this like constant push, 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 you know, figure it out, be better, do more. Not useful, probably. Um, resting, uh, which is <laughs> like kids are going to crack up or they won't ever watch this, but uh, you know, that, that I would say that, but I think there is something about starting with myself, my body and my mind and really having to get my mind to, to stop racing, going, 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 you know, leading the charge uh, and to not know, I think in my art, it, I mean, I, every single time I make a show and this is like 30 years, almost, I reach a moment where I'm like, this one's gonna suck this is it everybody's gonna come and they're never gonna come back <laughs> I'm really I'm gonna I'm gonna fall like this is gonna be the bad one it happens every time I'm a little more comfortable with the meltdown um that happens when you create and make something and getting a little more trusting that it's part of the process but um but I think that that that's where I'm starting yeah that's I'm trying to to re-nature, I don't know, you might call it decolonize. I, I don't know, but but uh but but starting with my own body and my own mind. It's great. I would love to hear what you're up to if we have time. Yeah, I think um even 10 years ago, my mindset was, you know, when you're younger and you think that you know everything and right mom <laughs> you think you know everything and you think that what you know you're gonna push out on everybody else and things like that I had those types of feelings before I think for me um and also like now thinking like I've started to really feel maybe in the last year like wow my youth is I know over, you know what I mean? I'm in this next stage of my life and um, I'm an only child, but I still think of my community and thinking about how, how can I be a, a good auntie, you know, how, how can I serve in those ways? And for me, it's about, first of all, my relationship with the land and being on the land more and more and making sure that I'm on the land, but also um, how am I uh, pushing that forward, right? How am I teaching others about relationships with land and um, showing them if we don't have a relationship to land, then 
our culture is going to die because everything that we I don't want to say use <laughs> everything that gives us service for our um, cultural practices is from the land. And so it's really important for us to establish ourselves as um, relatives of the land and um, and for just to treat our bodies in a way that's uh, cyclical and, and pay attention to uh, the seasonal cycles and um, combining that with how, you know, our traditional calendars that we follow. And, um, you know, I tell people all the time that Monday is moon day and you should do the absolute least on Mondays and take it easy. I call it bare minimum Mondays. <laughs> and I think that's a way to become more one with nature as you're, you know, listening to your body yeah I think you know just kind of listening to yourself and listening to to, to water um, sitting with water um, even talking to water right <laughs> so thank you. panelists with um, all the attention these days on equity what does that mean in the context of the waters we live with urban, you know, rural, indigenous. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, I subscribe to a, 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 a relatively marginal kind of worldview that I that I, you've heard me reference and mention, you know, a few times that kind of you can think about in a variety of ways, like kind of self willed nature, ecocentrism, some traces of like bioregionalism. But I, I think that the the core conviction is that if if you want to erode or eliminate the you know some of the key buzzwords of the of the contemporary conversations such as white supremacy or male supremacy or just all the kind of like the social injustice forms of supremacy you can't do that without rec recognizing that they're all based on human supremacy as the this kind of great chain of being notion that our species is is fundamentally and without really any more need for investigation superior um, to all other forms of life and to all other landscapes. And I think that it's it 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 creates a real challenge in the con in the context of uh, of like a larger equity conversation because what I see repeated time and time again among the most progressive liberal radical you know people i know is the fact that like you know not supporting like you know continuing to support factory farming continuing to support kind of water extraction etc is like kind of a joke it's like ah that's for tree huggers etc and so the, the extent to which a, a very i would say like christian supremacist like great chain of being ideology has been incorporated even by secular people and even by liberal people of like kind of we're at the top and we belong here and we can kind of every anything and everything we do is justified it has to be for me at least the first principle in terms of any equity conversation other otherwise you're just really kind of rearranging the deck chairs on the titanic um you know kind of situation without without really addressing like i think the, a, the deeper concern again that's not i don't mean to to proselytize or preach, but like just to offer a sort of a different, um, maybe an unfamiliar, you know, kind of approach to the equity question. That's that's what I would offer. I mean, I think it goes back to the idea of getting away from the commodification of water. Um, 
and knowing and getting into the mindset that every human has the right to clean water. Um, I was thinking about a conversation that me and my mom were having the other day about um, letters that were sent home from uh, settler, new settlers on this land and how they were writing about how you could, there was abundance of food and uh, you could reach into any river and grab a fish and be able to eat, right? And, um, you know, capitalism really took all of that away. And um, I always need my notes because I have a very short-term memory, especially after I hit 40. <laughs> um, and yeah, like we talked about, Paula brought it up that we've had our conversations around personhood. Um, you know, thinking about the what words that we use, maybe there needs to be something else because personhood uh, alludes to that we are at the top of the food chain, then we're not, and we're not. So I'm just kind of processing that and just... Uh, balance and and getting back to economies that weren't rooted in capitalism there were thriving economies um thousands of years ago that uh weren't rooted in capitalism and how do we uh get back to that to have an equitable relationship not only um with each other but with the land and and really having balance in that just a, a quick thought but to the question of um, of the rights and, and personhood, you know, the the sort of the and I'm taking this from the, the legal philosopher, Martha Nussbaum, who's developed this concept of capabilities doctrine, she puts it. This is particularly in the realm of animal uh, animal welfare or basically like. If an if whatever like an, an entity like a is capable of. Right, whether it's like extremely fast running or like a very wide range or like great eyesight, then any infringement upon those capabilities is a problem. And you can frame that in terms of rights in the courts. You can frame it in terms of personhood as like a metaphor. But I think that um, by that same logic, we as a species are nowhere near in the society we're living in, like fulfilling our true capabilities as like as as animals and i think it's the root of so much discontent and so much disrespect toward nature and so much disrespect to our own bodies and ourselves and and to one another and so i i've found that idea of of capabilities um really you a, a useful and to me a pretty a pretty precise way to talk about a lot of these issues. And you could, you could, again, I mean, to your point, Chris, about the molestation of the rivers, it's like, if, if what a river is capable of is running downhill, like water, um, then let it, at, you know, at, at every, at every step of the reach, you know, like from, from the headwaters to the, you know, to the gulf. And so I, so, so that to me, for what it's worth, you know, if, if other people find that useful, I, I hope you do. But, but that to me has been like a, felt like a kind of a comfortable solution so far for like trying to grapple with a lot of these issues about gender relationships. Martha Nussbaum, she's in the law school at the University of Chicago. And, um, it's a pain to interrupt the conversation, but um, I'm very sure that all the ideas that have been shared today will keep resonating. Uh, conversations will keep sparking. Um, and uh, our events continue at 4.30 at the Centennial Museum. There's an exhibition going on there, and there's also the screening of Experience in the Bosque, which is a collaborative performance-based project that the uh, organizing committee of this conference has uh, brought on for like three years. And, uh, and after there's also an exhibition visit at the Rubin Center. And I hope you can continue to hang out and uh, people can continue the conversations with you. There are some refreshments. I can't thank you all enough. Chris Hall, Andy Everett, CJ Alvarez, and Alison Orr. Thank you, thank you very much.